so uh, thanks a lot. And of course, the uh, the uh, sponsor slide that shouldn't be missing in any uh, event, be it online or in person. Um, I, I'm. I would like to say that it's uh, great to be here, but I'm at home and it's not so great to be at home. It would be better to be in Munich, but uh, that's not much we can do about that. I'm still wearing pants for my for my talk. I don't know why, but somehow I've uh, taken that habit. But um, let me get into uh, dive straight into the content of this session because um, I think we have quite a lot of content and this is going to be, I'm not going to show code as such, because I think um, I, I'd rather try to explain some concepts that I use and how I use them and give you hints into what kind of code to look for, because I think that's uh, that offers the most value to all of you, um, instead of uh, me going through code at the highest possible speed in order to get through the entire code during half an hour. So for half an hour session, uh, I'd rather give you kind of the basics and some architectural ideas that I like to implement when using Azure Functions in ETL uh, scenarios. Um, but first, let me uh, briefly talk about um, Azure Functions. And uh, let me introduce to you um, Azure Functions for those who don't know them. Azure Functions are usually triggered by events, and there's many different triggers and many different events that can trigger the execution of an Azure Function. Um, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, they can be classified as compute on demand, and they can be implemented in different languages. However, I usually use uh, C Sharp because I feel happy with that. Um, Azure Functions are serverless or can be serverless, not necessarily, but they, they can be serverless. I, like to use them as serverless uh, uh, instances. Uh, but still, and this sounds like a bit of a contradiction, Azure Functions are able to handle state, meaning that you can pass certain variables, certain values, certain settings from one execution to, to the next, even though you don't have a server on which you'll store that state. And I'll talk a bit about that um, as well. Um, let me um quickly go into the triggers because I think the triggers are quite important. Is my is my screen still shared? Yeah, I hope so. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um so I've uh pulled up the uh create new project um template for Visual Studio and I'll uh just uh click on, on Azure function to give you an idea of what I mean with you have several triggers. So I'll just create an Azure function. Let me zoom out a little bit so that I don't have to scroll so much. And when I say we have many triggers uh, at hand, uh, this is what I mean. For example, you can have uh, blob triggers where you say, OK, I can trigger the execution whenever uh, a certain uh, a blob is uh, added to a container. So I can react on files being created in blob storage. Uh, I can trigger from uh, Cosmos to be uh, create, uh, creating or changing a document in a collection. I can trigger events from Event Hub and Event Grid. I can have HTTP triggers, which are quite common. For example, you can build APIs using uh, Azure Functions, REST APIs. Um, you can have IT Hub triggers. You can have queue triggers, where queue items trigger uh, execution of the code in your function. Of course, the same goes for Service Hub. And you can have stuff like timer triggers. And that's quite interesting, because timer triggers um, if we're talking about ETL scenarios and we're talking about having uh, Azure Data Factory as um, as orchestration solution, of course, you could talk about having time and triggers and triggering uh, certain functions from a timer um, and thereby uh, moving from uh, ADF to something you build yourself. However, I'm a fan of not reinventing the wheels, so I try to uh, use like a kind of best of breed approach here and use uh, ADF for orchestration because usually you don't have stuff that you do only in functions, but you have copy tasks and stuff like that. And I tend to try to use whatever's available there off the shelf um, in ADF and enhance the features using Azure Functions. So you could say you could use Azure Functions uh, similar to the way uh, those of you who have an SSIS background, you used to use 
uh, script components or script tasks in SSIS. And I'll give some examples about that in a moment. But first, I would like to talk to you about why I am a fan of serverless. And serverless is a, is a great thing for me because it takes the platform as a service idea to the next level. Um, you can create an Azure function in the portal in different ways. You can create an Azure function and specify um, an app service plan that has a certain scale and that has a certain number of uh, cores and that has a certain amount of memory and you can scale that up and down and everything. However, you can also create an Azure function using a consumption plan, meaning that um, Azure will take care of all these nitty gritty bits that I as a developer don't like to think about, like management scaling up and down if, if spontaneous requests come in, uh, provisioning compute power, deprovisioning uh, de compute power if, you, if you're over committed, stuff like that. I, I, I don't, I'm not really keen on, on doing that. I'm, that's not my strong suit, and I'm not keen on doing that. And so I like that the idea of serverless computing, of serverless functions, take that away from me, because that's a liberty I never asked for. Um, and so this serverless idea takes the platform idea to the next level and allows you to pay only for what you consume. And if I say pay only for what you consume, that's another great thing about uh, Azure Functions running on a consumption plan. If you're talking about ETL workloads, um, there's a certain number of executions, I think it's 1 million at the moment, per month that is free. And that's quite a lot of executions depending on the context of what you do. Um, but to make all of this a bit more real and to give all of this a bit more context and tell you how to use everything, I would like to pull up an example. And the example I would like to pull up uh, um, contains uh, my friend Bob. Bob is from Britain. Bob has an amazing beard and is the most friendly guy you've ever met. And he's a huge music fan. And any similarity to any real person is purely coincidental. So don't uh, think about it. And Bob, being a geek, uh, has provided Bob's music streaming API, an API where we can uh, see what he listened to. I even implemented Bob's music streaming API, but to demo this in half an hour is a bit um, too much, maybe. Um, and the idea is that uh, Bob's music streaming API, ah, I'll, I'll demo it. I'll show it in a moment. The idea is that Bob's music streaming API is secured, not using OAuth, but uh, Bob has come up with uh, something else, uh, basic easy access resource defense mechanism, so beard. And uh, I'll, I'll show you the implementation of uh, what I've done there so that you get an idea of what I'll, I'm trying to implement in a daily data warehouse load. OK. So let me pull up Postman and show you what I've done. So I'll pull up Postman. Ah, Postman. Each day I use Postman, it takes longer to load. <laughs> I have no idea why. But um, what I'm going to show you is I'll show you Beard, so the, the uh, authentication, the, the security, security mechanism that I've implemented for Bob's music streaming API, or that Bob has implemented for his music streaming API. I will show you um, a quick introduction of the entities that we can query there. So I've created a collection in Postman, and I'm really sorry there's not much that you can do to zoom into Postman. So this is not very presentation friendly, but I'll zoom into the bits that are important. So what I've done here, streaming API and to authenticate, I have to call a an endpoint called get beard and I pass the mustache to that endpoint. And if I do that, uh, I get a response that contains a goatee. And mustache plus goatee give me the full beard that I need to access the API. So what I do now, um, Bob has provided an endpoint. I'll have to add uh, the mustache and goatee as beard token to my header. And Bob has created an endpoint that is called get playlist. 
And if I query that endpoint, what happens is I get an array of songs. Well, basically, I get an, an array of IDs of songs. OK, so now in itself, that's not very helpful. I know that he listened to song 100 in this playlist and to song 101 and to song 33. But in itself, that is not the, the kind of information that we're looking for if we want to uh, work with that data. So what we can do next is we can get a song. And the get song uh, just takes the ID of a song. I saw 33 in there a moment ago. So I query and find out what song 33 is. And I'll get song and I'll pass the song ID in the URL parameters. And I'll find out that uh, song 33 is a song called Run to the Hills by some artist, some band called Band 4. So of course, Bob has also added an, an endpoint to query uh, the bands. So let's have a look at what band number 4 that we just saw in our uh, API is. So let's create band number four. And we can see that band number four is Iron Maiden. So Run to the Hill seems to be a song of Iron, Iron Maiden. I wouldn't know. I've only seen them live 80 times, so I'm not quite sure about that. Um, and that way, we can, we can uh, process through uh, the entire data and say, OK, um, I'll just query the playlist endpoint and get the different playlists. Then I'll iterate through the songs to get the, the song titles and what artists thereby, and then I'll iterate through uh, the, and then I'll fetch and I'll query the corresponding artists. And one thing I noticed and I wanted to point out to you is that in each execution of uh, this playlist, somehow Bob has one of one favorite song because song 101 seems to be in every playlist that he hosts so far. So let's have a look at song 101. What is song number 101? If we query song number 101, we can see that, strangely enough, it's called Hit Me Baby One More Time. So maybe we're lucky, and artist number 11 is just some artist that covers 90s pop songs. Let's have a look at that, check out what band number 11 is. Oh, no. Apparently, next to Run to the Hills, Bob also likes to listen to some Britney Spears. OK, so this should give you a very brief overview of the API that we're dealing with and the entities that we see in there and the way we can query them. So let's move on and talk about how can we extract data from that API. And the first, if you're coming from uh, ADF background, the first very naive approach will be to use uh, web uh, tasks, execute web tasks for all of that. So say, OK, I have a um, I have a data factory. I do my, my web call to authenticate to get my beard. Then I do my web call to get the playlist. Then I do my web call to get, to, to iterate the songs, to get the songs, to get the bands. And I can uh, persist everything in my database. So that will be one approach to do it, to do it all in ADF. And I'll not talk about downsides or upsides. I'll just talk about effects of what, what it means if we implement it that way and leave it more or less to you to figure out what is downsides and what's not. I have some feelings about what are downsides, and you'll probably uh, figure out what I don't like about that approach as we go along. But I'll try to, to not uh, um, uh, evaluate everything in detail, but rather give you an idea what to think about. For example, if you do it that way, all your hand error handling happens in ADF. So everything that you do happens in ADF. And that also means your integration, which is not the cheapest resource around uh, for your data factory, is running dur during the entire process, which is fine if uh, everything runs smoothly within a few seconds. But if your API is slow and you're fetching tens of thousands of entities, this might be a cost driver for your ADF processing. Um, You'll need to implement some way of handling timeouts if requests hang, if, if uh, you, you experience problems with responsiveness of your endpoints, of your APIs. And you'll need to think about streamlining and uh, implementing streamlining and parallelism in your uh, ADF for the way we uh, 
pictured it before, it's a fully synchronous process. Of course, in your in your for each loop in your ADF, you can set a degree of parallelism, but the the next activity will only be called after the previous activity has finished. So there's in itself no parallelism in the implementation that we have here. So my question always is, can we do better? And I'll be I'll be honest, I, I'm I'm not trying to to uh, make things look nicer than they are. Uh, we've implemented things like that. And I can tell you, yes, we can do better. This is the initial starting point. If you don't know how much you'll get, how quick your AP responds, you want a, a fast implementation, this is the way to go because this gives you a really fast and simple implementation to access the API. So let's move on to the second strategy. Or maybe, uh, Gerd, are there any questions on that or comments on that so far? No, also not in the chat so far. OK, then uh, let me move on to a rewrite of that um, of that architecture, rewrite of that structure. And that's something I've seen with customers where they say, OK, if doing all this in ADF is not so great, let's do it all in an Azure function. Because you told us Azure functions are great, so let's do it in the Azure functions. And if you do that, you can do something like you have an HTTP endpoint. Your data factory triggers that HTTP endpoint to start the entire process. Your function does the authentication, gets the playlist, iterates the songs, gets the songs, gets the bands, and writes everything to your database. So this is basically more or less the same. However, the entire flow of the solution has been moved from ADF to the Azure function. And what are the consequences if we implement it that way? We'll have error handling both in the data factory as it initiates the function and in the Azure function. Um, that's just something that will happen because we have another component that might fail and that we might need that need to handle errors. Uh, the integration runtime is only needed during the kickoff to initiate the Azure function. However, um, if you want to, to work with the results, you'll have to think about how to get back to ADF to continue the next pipeline. But I'll talk about that uh, off slide uh, at a later point. Um, timeout handling, in my experience, if you do it that way, can be problematic because there is timeouts for Azure functions and there is timeout for web activities calling the Azure functions in ADF. And once you reach the point where you extend the way where you Google how to extend runtime of Azure functions, I think you should really consider redesigning your solution because that's something uh, I wouldn't recommend doing. It's possible, but I think it's not the best way of doing it. And streamlining and parallelism has to be done in the Azure function, meaning that you'll have to implement threading. And I, for one, I've, I've implemented enough threads to knit pullovers that fit everyone, but I'm not keen on implementing threading if I don't have to. It's the kind of implementation that I know how to do it, but it's it's really it's really not something that I enjoy. So I try to avoid implementing multi-threading solutions and debugging multi-threading solutions. But if you want parallelism in here, if you want your uh, song loop to be parallel, you'll have to implement a parallel for each, which is fairly simple in .NET, we'll have to, I'll have to admit, but still something I'm not keen on doing. And again, this is a fully synchronous process. So if we implement it that way, we'll say, okay, once the for, the, the for each loop for the songs has completed, we'll start fetching the bands. So um, still, I think we can do better than that, and we can do much better using a uh, improved pattern of that. And let me show you that pattern. Let me explain to you that pattern and explain to you why I think that this is an improvement of the previous two patterns. And I'll spend more time on the next pattern because um, this is the one that I, I really, um, I implemented several times now and really works well for me. So that's uh, the one I'd like to spend a bit more time. I, I was hurrying through the first two because uh, we're a bit short on time if we want to get through all the content. Um, but let's do that. 
So again, I initialize my uh, function from ADF in whatever manner suits me. I do the authentication and I get the playlist. However, if I have this array of songs here on the right, what I'm going to do next is not fetch all these songs, but place them all in a storage queue. Storage queue comes with a storage account, so you have multiple storage queues available anyway in almost any Azure solution, I would say. I'm, I'm not aware of any Azure solution not using a storage account. I've never seen one, from, at least for myself. And I place all these songs, the IDs of each song, in a message in the storage queue. And then I implement an Azure function, a separate function, um, with a queue trigger. And if I have that one on a consumption plan, what happens is as I place songs in the queue, Azure will spawn up new functions that uh, will process one queue message each. And each one will call my API and get the information the song. So what I've implemented here is basically a fan out pattern using storage queue and using Azure functions without implementing fan out myself. Uh, which I think is, is great for, for improving performance, which is great for, for improving uh, uh, your load process. And now think about, for example, if you didn't want to do single requests, but um, we've done this, for example, querying the JIRA API. And the JIRA API is paginated. And I can just write into my queue for each uh, issue, I paginate getting the tasks get page one of the tasks. And I get page one of the tasks of the first issue, and I place into the queue, get page two of the task. And I do that until the page I, re I get returned is empty. So that way, I'm able to, to have fetch the tasks for multiple issues in parallel. I have a fan out. And I have the, the control loop that keeps calling the API for the next page, also within the same mechanism. And that enables me to, to implement a very efficient way to get this data. So the, this little playground, beard, streaming, uh, Rob's, you'll know, I said it, uh, Bob, uh, music streaming API um, is a very, is, is just the, the simplified pattern of what you can do with a pattern like that. Now, each of these functions uh, has a band ID and just places that into another storage queue or the same storage queue if you want to design messages, but I recommend using a different storage queue. And here, if the same pattern, uh, this fans out, I have another function running on uh, a consumption plan, and this fans out and starts to get all those bands in parallel if necessary. So this is a way that I can implement fairly quickly with very reasonable code changes from what we've seen before. and. Now let's talk about the consequences. Of course, we again have error handling in ADF and in the function, because those are the two resources involved. Uh, the integration runtime, again, is only required to, to initialize the entire process. Um, since I broke down my function to very small requests, usually if I do this right, I won't have to handle timeouts, because each call itself is a small call and a small request and will work well. I've introduced some kind of resiliency, meaning that if one call to fetch a song or to fetch a band fails, all the others can still run and produce data. And just the one that fails goes off. And this is something that's quite important if you're dealing with web APIs, because web APIs, in my experience, the ones I have to deal with, are often not consistent and are often producing errors for single calls. And you don't want one single call of 10,000s to fail the entire process often. So if you don't want that, you can implement it that this pattern uh, run all the other calls even if one fails. Um, yeah. Especially when it comes to, for example, data warehouse loads, there could be um, reasons that, uh, that with this approach you end up with inconsistent data. Yes. Yeah, like retry logic and stuff in Azure you Functions. You can implement, re since it's code, you can implement any retry logic you want. What you can do, and what I often do, is uh, in my try catch, in the catch block, if I run into an error, I just requeue the message and I add a counter. How often was it requeued? 
Mm -hmm. So, so you can have retry logic via the same mechanism and just requeue your function, uh, your your message, and increase a counter in that message. Yeah. Uh, that's something that you can do. And what I, the other thing I do is I black uh, I I dead letter. So if I've reached a number of retries, then I place it into another queue, into a dead letter queue, that I can uh, uh, use in the end to figure out what failed and why. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, we also do have another question, not directly related, um, but I just ask it. Um, yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. So whether there is a, an, an impact on if you use one single consumption plan for all of your function or whether you use um, one um, consumption plan per function? Um, there is an, it depends. If you're using, uh, if you're using serverless functions, you'll have one consumption plan per, fun per function. Um, if you're using uh, app service plans, in meaning that you, set your um that you select your uh you provision your compute instances and everything then of course uh you will reach the limits of that, those resources sooner the more functions run on, on the same plan okay does Great. that answer the question yes that answers the question yeah. okay i think we don't have very long i have also a question yeah sure um uh, I have a question about memory usage. I mean, when you use a consumption plan, you have like 1.7 gigabyte, gigabytes of memory. Yeah. And if you have multiple functions running in one function app, do they share the memory? Or is it per function within a function app? I think it's per, I'm not 100% sure. I understand the question, but I'm not 100% sure. I think it's per instance, if you're on a consumption plan. Okay. so. For example, if I run a durable function, I can spin up multiple activities. It's a different pattern, I know. Yeah. But if I spin up multiple activities, do they each have 1.7 gigabytes of memory or are they I think sharing? so, yes, I think so. But I'd, I'd have to research. I'm not 100% sure, but I think each of them has the memory. No, I'm quite sure, like if you have an if you're using an app service plan which is limited to one let's say 1.7 gigabytes. Yeah, then then you're limited to that. that. Run on that app service plan can in total not exceed those 1.7 um, gigabytes. Yeah, but if you're on a consumption plan, I think it's per instance. Let's yes, I guess too. Spin up. Um, and, but and let me talk about with... durable entities maybe for a second, okay? Because we're running out okay, of time. Cool. And I'd just like to place durable entities here, and we can discuss this afterwards, uh, and maybe in the in the chat for the for the kickoff this morning, if that's okay. Because I would like, I'd really like, because this is really something that I'm, I'm that's really important to me. I would really like to to uh, introduce durable entities into this whole thing. You've already introduced them, but still, um, we can do even better uh, if we're assuming uh, that, for example, the bands don't change in our example. Um, we do not need to query the API each time to find out that band number four is Iron Maiden. So the idea is either we can access the database, that's slightly better, but not much better, um, because we have connection limits and fanout can be a real pain there. Or the alternative is to use, and I'll just drop the keyword here, um, to use durable entities to enable uh, storage of these IDs. And what durable entities do for everyone just to quickly understand it uses another aspect of uh, storage accounts it uses tables in storage accounts and stores the entity that you've queried in this table and then accesses that table and you don't have to care about uh, uh, updating that because this is kind of a cache that exists during different executions of the same function and that's all that I wanted. I just wanted, to, this was really important to me to bring durable functions, durable entities into play here, because this is something, if you're thinking about using Azure functions, if Azure functions might be helpful to what you're doing. Um, I, I really like them. I think they're really great and, and versatile help us that you can use in many patterns. I've shown you some patterns that you can use, and I'd really uh, like to encourage you to start working with functions rather today than tomorrow because they're great helpers that can can improve a lot of your data loads and now i think we're spot on time right yeah ha. we have one minute over but that's okay that's one minute is, is acceptable i think <laughs> so if there are 
Any questions left? Feel free to ask them now. Um, ben and I will stay here for at least the next 15 minutes. And yeah. Yeah. So I think Mark, you had some questions before on the durable functions, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, correct. Um, I was curious about the memory and, and I was also curious about the instances. I mean, what I saw in the app service plan, if I if I if I'm correct, if I use the elastic premium one, then I can burst out 20 instances. But I'm not getting the concept of an instance in this case. I mean, is, it, is an instance an activity or is the instance an orchestration? If you're if you're using a premium consumption uh, a premium plan, it's not a consumption plan, I think. Then you have uh, dedicated resources. Yeah, I, I think I, I yeah, that's correct. But if I look in the settings of uh, the Elastic Premium Plan, uh, I can see that I can burst out into 20 instances, but I'm not sure what an instance is. I I would I'm not sure because I've never used the, the premium <laughs> plans because I tend to use the, the consumption plans uh, in most workloads, but I think uh, an instance is actually a, a, a compute instance that you can run up on. Okay, okay. So it's maybe it's, it's then a orchestration and within the orchestration, it start activities. Because I, yes. I'm using the Elastic Premium because I, I they have Finet integration, and yeah. the consumption plan doesn't have Finet integration. So if we want I to know. be, if we want to be able to connect to a database with a firewall and so on, then then I have yep. to. Then use, you have to uh, use Premium, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's it's actually compute instances and the number of of function instances you run on that compute is basically whatever you design it to be. 